Welcome to uh, the latest Bristol University Press uh, webinar. Uh, it's time to stop business as usual. Uh, I'm chairing today's session. Um, I'm Dr. Harry Pitts. I'm a lecturer in work, employment, organisation and public policy at University of Bristol School of Management. Um, and I'm delighted today to uh, introduce four speakers who I'll introduce in a moment after some uh, housekeeping. Um, so uh, just going to go through some, some, some basics. Um, and if you missed them, I think they'll be repeated in the chat. So don't worry if you're just coming in as I'm talking about this. Um, please type any questions you have in the uh, Q&A function, which is at the bottom of uh, the Zoom screen. Um, and those questions then I'll be putting to uh, the panelists in the Q&A um, session. So there's no need to uh, raise your hand or type in the chat. It all goes in the Q&A. If you have any technical issues with that, then you can use the chat and uh, uh, make sure someone's aware of that and they'll help you out with that. We have closed captions enabled on this webinar. Um, there's a button at the bottom of your screen um, which says CC live transcript. So you can click on that and that will show or hide the text as you prefer. Um, and also uh, we have uh, four speakers today all with books. Um, on sale at the moment, and those books will be available at a 50% discount for attendees of this webinar. Um, you can use the code BUSINESS50, uh, BUSINESS in capitals 50, um, at checkout, um, and that will give you 50% off their excellent books. And a recording of this webinar, if you choose to uh, relive it, um, will be available uh, after the event as well. So, Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, our authors. We're joined today by Carl Rhodes, who's the author of Woke Capitalism, and he's Professor of Organisation Studies at the University of Technology, Sydney. Catherine Trebek is a researcher and an advocate for a new economic paradigm and co-author of The Economics of Arrival. Andreas Nolke is Professor of Political Science at Goethe University, Frankfurt, and author of Post-Corona Capitalism. And Ian Thompson, is co-author of Urgent Business and Professor of Accounting and Sustainability um, at the University of Birmingham, and also Director of the Lloyds Banking Group Centre for Responsible Business. So we have an excellent panel today, um, and we're going to kick off with uh, each panellist is going to speak for um, approximately eight minutes each um, on the topic at hand today. Um, and then uh, we'll come back together then for a Q&A afterwards. So you can, by all means, uh, put your questions in the Q&A as we're talking, as, as uh, panellists are talking, um, or I'm sure we'll, be, uh, we'll succumb to a deluge of questions um, at, the, uh, at the end. So I'm going to begin um, by handing over to Carl for, uh, for his thoughts on the topic of business as usual in this age of crisis, conflict and pandemic. Over to you, Carl. Thank you. Thanks very much, Harry, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, so it's time to stop business as usual. Now, the, this webinar is happening at a pretty terrible time in history. I mean, Russia has aggressively invaded Ukraine uh, and without provocation. You know, innocent Ukrainians, including children, are dying. And this has received widespread condemnation across the world, including from many large corporations and other businesses. Now, Many of the corporations, however, were quite slow to react initially, especially those um, uh, that had significant commercial and financial interests in Russia. Now, if you look at an example, just last Sunday, the, the uh, oil company Shell released a statement. They said, despite being appalled by the events in the Ukraine and making various attestations to actions, they also stated, and I quote, Yesterday, we made the difficult decision to purchase a cargo of Russian crude oil. Now, if they didn't, they said, this might interrupt their ability to provide essential services across Europe. And they, they added another quote, uh, another statement, and I quote, uh, that they would choose alternatives to Russian oil wherever possible. Now, this statement didn't come out of nowhere. It was in response to events that had happened the previous day on last Saturday. And uh, what happened was that a ship carrying Shell's Russian crude oil arrived in the UK, ready to uh, offload its cargo to be processed at the Stanlow oil refinery, not far from Liverpool. The problem, however, was that the day before that, on Friday, 
the uh, the dock workers union, the Unite Union, had re released a statement, and they said again to quote. Under no circumstances would they unload any Russian oil, regardless of the nationality of the vessel which delivers it. So this was workers in solidarity with uh, Ukrainian citizens. Now, the dockers kept to their word, uh, and the ship sailed on with the cargo intact. Meanwhile, the Russian foreign, uh, sorry, Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, tweeted a message to Shell, and he said, doesn't Russian oil smell like Ukrainian blood for you? I call on all conscious people around the globe to demand multinational companies to cut all business ties with Russia. Now, by Tuesday, this is all just like just a few days ago, right? By Tuesday, the mounting pressure actually led Shell to completely change its tune and it sent out another announcement, this time saying that they were withdrawing entirely from Russian oil and gas industry and they were going to close all of the petrol stations in Russia itself. It was kind of a mea culpa. Uh, Shell apologized for its decision um, uh, that it had made a few days earlier to, to buy the oil. And the, the chief executive of Shell, a um, guy called Ben Van Burden, uh, conceded, and to quote from his statement, ultimately, it is for governments to decide on the incredibly difficult trade-offs that must be made during the war with Ukraine. We will continue to work with them to help manage the potential impacts on the security of energy supplies, particularly in Europe. And this had come just after the, uh, Joe Biden in the US had actually himself banned all uh, Russian oil imports. In his words, he wanted to, tar to target the main artery of the Russian economy. Now, the interesting thing here is I'd say that Van Buren was right, at least the second time around, um, and in terms of the question, today's question, how can business add value to society in, a, in an authentic and sustainable way? I'd say, well, they can do so by getting out of politics and following the decisions of citizens and their elected representatives, not something that they have been often want to do in practice. So in other words, I would say that the corporations add value, if we use that term, by rendering themselves subservient to political sovereignty uh, and effect to, and democratically to popular sovereignty. Now that it took an illegal and devastating and deadly war in Europe for this to be admitted is a bit of a sad indictment of those corporations that recently are increasingly behaving like they should be the ones in charge of the world's affairs often condemning government as weak and ineffectual. This isn't just about the power of the US presidency, it's also about the collective power of individual citizens and workers, particularly as we saw with, with the, the dock workers um, uh, from Unite. Corporations like Shell that refused or dragged the chain in pulling out of Russia have been widely condemned and called to account by the public. Now, they're not the only examples. You know, if you look at iconic brands that really represent the whole idea of Western consumerism, Coca-Cola and McDonald's, they are also amongst the laggards and they had significant financial interests uh, in Russia. But what quickly happened, and again, this is just the last couple of weeks, the hashtags boycott McDonald's and boycott Coca-Cola were all over Twitter. Even the Hollywood actor Sean Penn, who you might recall was in Ukraine at the time of the inv invasion and fled to Poland on foot. Um, he was ridiculing the big brands and asking his followers to boycott them. And in the end, both of the companies were shamed into withdrawing. Um, and just yesterday, actually, uh, they each announced that they're out of Russia, but well, kind of at least for now. Um, I think they're keeping their, hedging their bets uh, on that. And in a public statement, the, the head of McDonald's, uh, Chris Kamzinski, stated that the reason that it was temporarily closing all of its 847 Russian outlets was because, and to quote from him, our values mean we cannot ignore the needless human suffering unfolding in Ukraine. Now, one can only imagine that the fear of the devastating financial impact of a mass boycott of McDonald's restaurants outside of Russia and the irreparable brand damage that it would cause are also part of Kemzinski's treasured values. So corporations withdrawing from Russia, as well as other commercial sanctions, are clearly an absolutely critical way 
in which the Russian invasion of Ukraine can be resisted and very much part of their effort. But these aren't feel good, woke corporate sentiments designed to align with brand values. They're powerful political means through which Russia's ability to maintain its war effort can be weakened. So when we look at McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Shell and their others who withdrew late, what we see is not some kind of corporate munificence based on a set of cheesy values. Instead, what we see is these corporations not being as powerful as they might believe. And when push comes to shove, it shows that democratic power and, um, and sovereignty of people, uh, whether that's exercised by representative government or by citizens, is what is holding political power um, uh, to account, the power that they are granted as a social and legal license to operate. So concluding, what can business add to society in an authentic and sustainable way? Well, it's certainly not by proclaiming progressive values and pretending that all stakeholders matter equally. It's by recognizing their place in a political order. And in politics, corporations are not leaders, they are followers who need to work within the law to support the political will of the citizenry. In this case, the international condemnation of Russia's uh, illegal and deadly invasion of U Ukraine. And in this case, despite some reluctance, that in the end is what has happened. I mean, how corporate sanctions and withdrawals will contribute to the ending of this awful, abysmal war is yet to be seen. But it's the contribution I think that we can all make is to continue to demand that corporations can and should make that contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, those contributions, Carl. Um, next, without further ado, I'm going to move over to Catherine. Um, welcome, Catherine. And uh, yeah, you have uh, also eight minutes. Thanks. Thanks ever so much, Harry. And, and Carl, it was interesting listen, listening there, thinking there used to be a theory that two countries where McDonald's operated would never go to war with each other. Well, we've seen that one blown out of the water, haven't, haven't we? Um, in a way, I think I think we need almost a parallel webinar to this one, really questioning business as usual, because I think we need to put the onus of responsibility on proponents of the current regime, the current system, the current setup to justify why the priorities, practices and policies of today that reinforce businesses as, as usual are good enough and the best we can expect in the face of environmental breakdown and all sorts of vertical and horizontal inequalities. Uh, I think in a way they, they, we need to ask much more of those who would say that the status quo is the best we can get and think it is actually the best of all regimes uh, rather than constantly feeling it's up to those of us uh, who dare to think we can do better than what we've currently currently got to argue that. But having said that, let's look at what proponents of businesses as usual might might say. And I want to share with you just two quotes that I've heard in the, in the last couple of years in diff very different contexts, just to give you a bit of a sort of vignette or caricature of, of some of the arguments. So just if one, and let's call the, the person who articulated this quote, just you know for, for no better reason, Donald Ena. And the phrase is, I hate seeing shootings, but they are certainly good for business, says one. And then the other quote, let's call the person who said this, Milton Eller, says, enough of this talk about well-being, let's just let us get down to business. And these, these two quotes put together sort of almost describe and characterise some of the inherent mindsets of that pervade and reinforce and underpin business as usual. This essentially this idea that profit matters ab above all other considerations to the likes of Donaldina and Miltonella, and that business has no role in an, any other wider considerations. But I think it's this, this question around, is the role of business exclusively about a narrow understanding of profit or can we dare to ask questions around the role of profit as a vehicle to perhaps some bigger and wider and more collective goals that directly speak to the needs of people and planet? And when we're starting to think, you know, is profit at all cost still a good? And I think Carl's examples really underline that, you know, at, at what cost are we really to 
prepared to entertain this a narrow focus on profit uh, in the short term. And these questions are only going to be solved, but if we ask ourselves a few more questions, and they speak very much to the nature of ownership and governance and the very DNA of an enterprise. And I want to share with you particularly three dimensions that if we're going to imagine a different, more proactive role of enterprise in solving and contributing to the solutions of some of societies and the world's most intractable problems, but also being part of building that better world. These seven dimensions are what we need to start asking ourselves and really reimagining the nature of business. So firstly, around redefining success, the very purpose of business, you know, what's the driving force that business is envisaging for itself? Secondly, around questions of ownership and governance, you know, is either centralized in very few, or is it delegated to where people are most affected? We also thirdly need to think about leadership and participation. Who is it that drives the business? Is it in an individual or is it a much wider collective, a wider set of interests around that table? Third, fourthly, we need to think about community and stakeholder relationships. Are they mutually beneficial and explicitly designed to be so or extractive? Fifthly, need to think about product and service innovation. Is it designed for positive impact or perhaps only just minimizing negative impact? Essentially the difference between regenerative approach or just mere sort of 1990s sustainability. Sixthly, and this is where I probably should have had a slide so you could see these all as bullet points. But sixthly, we need to think about how do we account for impact and return on investment? Essentially, how do we translate that vision and that purpose into tangible measured outcomes that internal incentive systems and structures are aligned to so individuals operating within the enterprise understand what they're focusing on and finally we need to question this idea of learning together does the enterprise foster an environment where failure is okay and seen as an opportunity to learn so it's only by taking a good hard look at these questions, the questions of ownership, governance, purpose, how relationships happen, what is the central driving force around product design and service innovation that will start to get beyond are uh, any of these wider questions seen as merely an irritant to those making decisions in business or mainly a threat to the idea of making the shortest, biggest profit in the shortest possible time frame, Or will we start to understand that if we can ask these questions, we'll bring out the best of business so they can play a proactive role in contributing to the solutions of some of these multiple crises that we've, we've heard about and I suspect most people on this call will have their heads around. Because of course, what also happened last week is we heard the IPCC reminding us that the window of opportunity to change is narrowly closing. And so I think this business as usual, clearly not good enough, but we can't just stick these as ads on. We need to look at the very, very heart of DNA of enterprises. Thanks, Harry. Thank you so much, Catherine, um, for those reflections. Um, next, we're going to be moving to um, Andreas Nolka. Um, hi, Andreas. Thank you, Harry. Uh, let me briefly uh, share my slides with you um, just to support my brief presentation. Now, as you will see um, during my short uh, talk, uh, I will have very similar um, themes or messages uh, as, as Carl and, and, and Catherine, so this fits quite well. Um, but I'm coming from a very different uh, perspective, let's say not the current crisis, but the one before the current crisis or one that is slowly, hopefully uh, retarding. And um, the basic idea is that uh, such a big crisis and, and the corona pandemic uh, was the largest economic crisis since the Second World War, um, increases a lot of uncertainty for, for business and, and the corona pandemic was particularly complex if compared with other um, uh, pandemics. And what I've done in, in, in this book is to, to make a comprehensive survey on different topics related to capitalism uh, to give you just a one-stop uh, survey what are the most important uh, changes based on empirical studies other people have done uh, during the last um, years. And the, the focus is not on, let's say, a grand interpretation on abstract theorizing, but very on very specific issues that happened, uh, the policy alternatives uh, that we're having uh, here. It goes through all, all kinds of issues that are related uh, uh, to capitalism from the relationship between capitalism to society, 
uh, to the institutions of capitalism domestically, internationally, geoeconomic uh, issues, um, and so on. So it's, it's rather comprehensive, and each, each topic is, is covered very rather rather briefly. Now, for our talk today, I have focus um, on uh, important implications for business, and there's across the, the 30 chapters, there's a very clear message um, uh, in the book that runs through many of the topics I have covered uh, based on the, on the research other people have done. Um, I think we will see in the next years to come a far more prominent role of the state. That can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing. So this is not, uh, not, not clear yet. It very much depends on, the, on your government. But uh, I think uh, the importance of the state will, will increase. And we, let me give you some, some examples uh, where, where I see this. We see this with, with fiscal policies that have played a much more important role during the last years. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, companies have realized how important it is to have uh, financial uh, support in many countries, uh, and, and they have to cultivate uh, linkages to the government. Uh, we have seen a new uh, emphasis on industrial policies. Uh, many governments have uh, are focusing on issues of technological sovereignty that you're not so dependent uh, from uh, uh, companies in other countries. So there will be some kind of an inward looking uh, issue here and a lot of public activity in this, in this field. I think also in the field of, of corporate governance, and, and this is something that has been raised already uh, previously, I think uh, the idea that uh, shareholder value should really be the only thing that companies are, are carrying is, uh, is retreating. I think we have seen a lot of uh, discussions on, on, on a much uh, more prominent public responsibility of governments. Of course, there's a, there's a long way to go uh, to implement these issues, but they are very prominent, uh, at least with, uh, with, uh, within the European Union. And we also see that as the state uh, has started uh, to take a very close eyes on crucial companies, starts protecting crucial companies, for example, vaccination companies in, in Germany that was very unforeseen in Germany that the state has simply invested uh, a substantial part um, uh, of money uh, in order to prevent it being uh, sold uh, to the US. It's very, very unusual for the, for the order liberal uh, Germans. We have seen the same with regard to competition um, uh, policies or as, as a conscious effort by the European Union, for example, to uh, support companies against uh, US and, and Chinese companies. Uh, state aid uh, uh, is, is way more uh, liberal, has been way more liberal during the last years. Um, we see a lot of uh, state support for reshoring of, of production because we have seen that there can be major issues uh, with regard um, to uh, global value change. So uh, either production is reshored, uh, let's say within country, within the European Union, or at least in the, in the neighborhood. We have seen absolutely unforeseen levels of screening of uh, FDI, particularly of inward FDI, and particularly from China. There was a strong concern during the last years uh, that Chinese companies are buying, let's say, uh, uh, very important uh, European uh, companies, the same, same uh, in the US. There's also a growing concern about uh, the dispute settlement uh, system. Um, the corona pandemic will, will create lots of, of claims by, by business uh, uh, this is something that's hardly uh, acceptable uh, for the public um, because uh, the costs cannot be borne by the, by the, by the public. And we have seen in trade policy uh, a tendency towards increasing protectionism. We have seen lots of export curbs. Um, so again, uh, the state has taken on a way more prominent role. And let me conclude um, many of these uh, things that and my book clearly is only on the, on the corona uh, pandemic, not on the war. But since we're living in these, these times, I think many of the tendencies that I have observed um, will be amplified by the war. We will see in the future, uh, irrespective how the outcome of, uh, of the outcome of the war, increasing geopolitical tensions. Of course, the state will be more important. We have just discussed uh, the issue of politicization of business decisions, uh, for example, the withdrawal from, from Russia by McDonald's uh, and so on. And we will see sanctions and, uh, and counter sanctions. So generally, my hunch is that in the years to come, uh, business will not be private business anymore, but rather a public issue. This can be bad if you have a bad government, but this also gives us a new perspective for the democratic steering of business. Thank you. Stop this. 
Thank you, Andreas. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, I'm going to turn now to uh, Ian um, for his thoughts on uh, the topic of business as usual. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Just um, let me try and uh, share screen. Imagine how much better the world could be if businesses took responsibility for their impact and dependencies on socio-ecological systems. Imagine if we're able to hold them accountable for all their impact, positives and negatives. And imagine if businesses worked within the ceiling provided by planetary boundaries and the foundation of, accept of minimum acceptable social conditions. This has to be the space where businesses operate. I suppose the real question is how they've been able to exist outside that space for so long, particularly given how fragile businesses are and how dependent they are on society and natural systems. Businesses now need to, to, to contribute to the resilience of these critical socio-ecological systems that contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We need to address the business exceptionalism mindset that businesses are not part of the world. Their businesses aren't out there. They're part of our lives. They're part of our interconnections and part of their dependencies uh, with, the, with the world. I think when we're looking at the sort of idea of the business as usual, I think we need to challenge some of the stereotypical tropes of business. I mean, what is it that we mean when we say business as usual or business to blame? Is it the faceless multinational financial institution? facilitating kleptocratic, kleptocratic governments? Is it exploitative fast fashion producers, junk fast, junk fast food sellers? Or is it a small family business producing organic food to local communities? Or social enterprises driven by purpose or cooperatives where they share value? And sometimes we need to challenge some of the simplistic notions of what a mythical business is, does and what they do and why they do the things they do. One of the things that we try to do in our book is to challenge these myths and actually kind of really count challenge the idea. People have talked about this before, that business success is about maximizing profit and growth. Not true. You only manage what you measure. Not true. Laser-like focus gets results every time. Not true. The consumer is always right and to blame for things. Not true. And only irresponsible leaders make irresponsible decisions. Not true. These myths seem to be ways to divert blame, making others and te or technology responsible for un unsustainable decision. I can have a version of that. I was only hitting my KPIs. It's not much of an excuse, really, is it? What about if we play with, um, with thinking about business in a different way? What about defining it by its ecosystem services? What ecological system role does our business play? Is it an extractor, concentrator, recycler, or disperser of nutrients? Does it pollinate, create new life, or help consume and break down waste material? Is it a keystone species that impacts the health of the whole ecosystem? Or is it a small organism that performs essential routine tasks? Or is it a parasite sucking the life out of its host? Does the myth of profit maximization encourage a suitably diverse range of business and business models? Our business ecosystem has been overwhelmed by nutrification of nutrient-hungry corporates that are choking the oxygen from other smaller firms. Is the exponential growth demanded by venture capitalists causing the desertification of business ecosystems to the detriment of all? This gives us the what is the point or purpose of business? The answer cannot be to maximize profit. Much hilarity has been made recently by venture capitalists over Unilever defining the purpose of their product, particularly mayonnaise. Why is this a laughing matter? Surely all businesses need to think about the purpose and performance of their products of service. Of course they do, and to do it with in reference to all of the sustainable development goals. We need to think about who wins, who loses, suffers, pays, benefits across time and space of a total value chain because the answers to these questions are critical to the ability to create sustainable value, how to compensate for any negative impact and how to redistribute that value. We need to recognize that we cannot rely on partial subsidized distorted prices, which very rarely tell the sustainable truth of any product or service. Costs now need to be better aligned with their sustainable consequences. 
And we need to be very careful about misaligning how we evaluate a thing with its systematic impacts. Right now, we're, we're translating climate change concerns into projected increase in the cost of household energy as a reason for perpetuating climate change without stopping and thinking about the different ways that cost, is that cost could be calculated or prices could be set. Or focus on the ethnic pay gap as if a salary increase can address institutional racism. Ethnic pay gaps are evidence of a serious problem, but it's not one that's solved by paying people with just purely by money. Fixing a metric is not the same as fixing a problem. In the UK, we have a greenhouse gas reporting system that creates false positive evaluations for businesses closing down local farms and producing and importing, even air freighting these same products from across the globe. False negatives from rewilding a car park and building facilities to support active travel rather than car commuting and allows fossil fuel companies not to count for any greenhouse gas arising from the use of their products. But we teach and perpetuate these myths in business schools and MBAs are used to, to legitimate unsustainable decisions. These myths infiltrate popular culture, reality TV and game shows, promoting a, distort, a, dis, a distorted discourse about what it means to be a successful businessman, and I use that term deliberately. I walk my dog with police detectives who refuse to watch police, police procedurals. Do business people or academics refuse to watch and publicly criticize these nonsense business procedurals that glorify machismal, bullying, lone wolf, crass simplicity, and a lack of concern for long-term consequences or relationships? Or do they take on these mantles? Dogs don't eat other dogs. Why do we repeat it in business speak? And the Ukraine suggests that high street is not a war zone. Maybe we need a purge on war metaphors in business. We also rely on evidence produced by problematic accounting and finance system. Accounting techniques are taught that promote and legitimate climate chaos, incentivize unsustainable actions such as the destruction of land-based and marine ecosystems. Finance uses techniques such as discounting or net present value that are designed to promote intergenerational inequity. Poorly designed incentive schemes support irresponsible practices. Recruitment practices favor the sociopath rather than the empath or team players. And the contribution of the loyal, humble and honest is undervalued and not rewarded. We know all this, but why is it persisting and what are we actually going, trying to do about it? That is why um, within, within our kind of book, we've tried to kind of create a kind of a checklist, new ways to thinking. We've created a responsible business manifesto um, positive pathways where people can start to move away from unsustainability towards sustainable. And we're also building educational, formal and informal materials to replace these myths with more responsible ways of thinking and doing business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, uh, for those reflections. And uh, now we've already got a couple of questions uh, coming into the Q&A. Um, to get us kicked off, but I'd encourage uh, anyone not to be put off by the fact there's questions there already. We've got plenty of time to get through uh, your questions, so uh, please do keep them coming. Um, I could easily abuse my permission, uh, position as chair here to ask uh, many questions of my own, but I'll, I'll cede it to the floor. Um, and the first question that came in um, was from an anonymous attendee, although you're quite welcome to identify yourself uh, in the chat if, it, if you want to. Um, and that question is, what specifically can be done to convince business leaders that business as usual is no longer acceptable and that sustainability should be integral to operations? Uh, and a second question within this one question, do the panellists think that legislation is necessary to move people away from the profit mindset? And if so, what form should this take? So very much a question about the role of state vis-a-vis -vis business. Um, the state has come up quite a few times, so maybe a chance to reflect on that. Um, I'll start off uh, seeing as he spoke uh, the longest time ago. I'll go to Carl to uh, to start off with this question, please. Thank you. So thank, thanks very much, Harry, and also to anonymous attendee for uh, asking this uh, this question. I think what can be done to convince convince business leaders. Uh, business leaders, I think, generally in the current system, are convinced um, uh, by things that will affect the bottom line, like the examples I gave before 
um, it, it seems like public pressure um, uh, um, to do things and not to doing those things that having commercial uh, detriment or financial uh, effects will certainly convince uh, business leaders. So I'm not sure. I mean, often these days, you know, well, uh, people are expecting some kind of moral conviction uh, to make the difference for, uh, for business leaders and conscious capitalism or whatever you want to call it is, is going to save us. I don't think we should rely on business leaders because relying on business leaders effectively cedes power to the effect that we have to expect business itself to do this. I think business, it, we need to demand of business that these things are done and that is done through the exercise of political power, both through democratic processes involving citizens, um, as well as through the, the acts of government. So I think, you know, to various points being made today, I think it's a time to really look at the role of the state, which in, in liberal democracies over the last 40 years of, of neoliberalism has kind of just in many ways withdrawn um, into a kind of small government uh, mode that's just cheerleading on the sidelines for business. And I think the, the, the proper role of the state as, the, as representatives of popular sovereignty needs to be reinstated globally. Thank you, Carl. And I've noticed also there's, a, there's another question here also referring to a similar issue about the state. And uh, David Farnsworth points out that the state often subsidizes or rescues the profitability of organizations without requiring anything in return. So um, I'll pass over to Catherine now to, to kind of speak to that broader issue, I guess, addressed by these mm. questions about the role of the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis business. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Harry, and, and thanks yeah, for both, both questions. I mean, I think one of the most interesting developments in, in the sort of political response to COVID was seeing the emergence of the convers and the acceptability of the conversation around conditionality. Uh, essentially, meant several governments, many of them um, more bold and robust in this than, than others, of course, but saying it's not acceptable for certain businesses to get state support to carry on through during COVID without, for example, showing their commitments, how they'll, they'll meet the Paris targets, uh, without Denmark, for example, was very early days out of, out of the stocks saying, you're not going to get a government grant, uh, a corona-related grant, if you are using tax havens. And I think that's a very powerful conversation that speaks to what Carl's describing, that we need to run this ruler, this democratic ruler, over the support that the state does, does for business. But I think it's also very clear that so often the state is a, is a laggard in that as well. It's often, if you mar imagine a marathon, it's often the sweet car at the end, you know, pulling, pulling up, the, up the stragglers. And so often it's civil society and communities mobilizing who are really pushing the agenda uh, that then you see actually business, often, you see good examples of businesses following behind that. I'd also say that to respond to the very first question, there are plenty of good examples where business leaders are already ste stepping up to the plate. And I think this speaks, loops back to a lot of Ian's points that there are lots of different business models that are already grappling with these questions of ownership and governance and internalizing a richer purpose beyond short-term profit. And I, let me just give you a couple, couple of examples because I mean, one, I don't know if you can see that here. This is a lovely um, craft brewing company that lives up the road from me here in, here in Glasgow called Jaw Brew. And the chap who runs that, I think wakes up every morning thinking about how he can make his business more sustainable. He does a whole line of beer using discarded bread from the nearby bakery. These are sanitary products made from a brilliant social enterprise called Hay Girls. And they have a buy one, get one free. So I buy a packet, someone who cannot afford sanitary products get, gets their own. A workers' cooperative, Green City Whole Foods, where you have the closing of that gap between labour and the owners of capital. And then on a much bigger scale, some of you will know of Triodos Bank, a B Corp business that is designed to channel financial capital into the sorts of economic activities we need more for. Plenty of other examples, as Ian outlined. I just say this because there are a lot of business leaders who are seeing enterprise and profit making as a vehicle rather than the goal in its own right. And I think that is one of the ultimate sort of 21st century questions we need to be asking. The more the state can enable that and create a smoother ride for those sorts of decisions, that I think is when we'll see the, the, the two coming together really powerfully. Thank you, Catherine, and thanks for those uh, product placements as well um, in, the, uh, <laughs> in your answer. Um, 
Andrea, so you, you spoke about the state and about the kind of maybe more auto liberal kind of model on, on the continent. Uh, there was a question there specifically about the UK and the different kind of role of the state and uh, what it asks in return for uh, for help and for legislation. I was wondering if you could also uh, speak to that issue of, uh, of the state. Thank you. Well, well, we have the same issue uh, on the continent as well. I mean, uh, companies have received huge uh, amounts of support during the crisis. Uh, and, and some companies at the same time have uh, made share buybacks, uh, paid dividends, paid dividends, and so on. This is not not acceptable. I mean, I'm I'm a political scientist, and as a political scientist, I have some kind of a of a, of a bias. I mean, we we political scientists we believe in democracy as as let's say the, the highest uh, value, and that's why um, democracy mainly in our societies is executed via the state. And that's why uh, my observation that the state becomes apparently more prominent uh, is for me is, is, a, is a reason for, for optimism. And uh, I'm a bit skeptical about, I mean, I, I very much appreciate any kind of social entrepreneurship, any kind of initiative for business to, to do better, but I don't want to rely, let's say, on the good, good conscience or the bad conscience of, of entrepreneurs. And I would rather prefer to have companies pay their taxes really fully without using any loopholes uh, than, let's say, making allocations for uh, corporate uh, social responsibility. But, but let me close with one warning. I mean, um, as I said, a more prominent role of the state can be really a positive thing that comes out of the, of the crisis, but only, of course, if this is a democracy and that if within this democracy, let's say, progressive uh, uh, forces are, are really strong. And we, of course, we have many states where, where we have populist, uh, right-wing populist leaders and strengthening the state in these societies, let's say, take Hungary, for example, or well, we don't want to talk about Russia <laughs> in this case, uh, no democracy uh, for that matter at, at all. But um, so the strengthening of the state is, is a bit ambivalent. It really depends on whether, let's say, progressive forces uh, are, are able to, to really to, to mobilize, uh, let's say, in democratic politics, or whether the, uh, the increased power of the state will be misused by, by darker forces. Excellent points. Thank you uh, very much, Andreas. Maybe we've exhausted, well, we've never exhausted the topic of the state in business, but um, maybe I'll give Ian a little bit of flexibility in the questions he uh, comes back. Okay. Speak to the state if you want, uh, Ian. Um, but there's also a kind of flurry of questions that have come in about the, the relative merits of different kinds of business models. So um, not-for-profits of various kinds. Um, also, uh, Will Harvey uh, uh, mentions the, the, the plenitude of different options that companies have uh, to take a more socially responsible route, um, you know, whether that's things like B Corps or, or stakeholder capitalism, um, and the fact that that can sometimes veer into a kind of greenwashing maybe or blue washing as he puts it um, and Malu Vieira also asks about uh, the, the merits of um, certification systems like B Corps um, and the different kinds of benefit corporations so I mean if we were to sit here and list them we would we would be here all day about the very different options that are available um, uh, so Ian maybe I'd, you want to kind of get into that those different options that companies have and the, and the fact that they yeah. are confusing but also limited and offer up different opportunities. Yeah, no, it, it, it is fascinating. I mean, I think there is a there's a there is a real seduction, you know, with, with labeling and certification. It's it's a real risk, you know, anxiety reducing kind of um sort of technology. But it's also it's also got to be really careful about how you, how you, how much you rely on on certification. And and you've got to look at the it's it's I suppose it's a little bit like um you know some of your know, education you know you get a qualification, like how well do you get that qualification? Do you just scrape through? And and when you actually look behind the figures of some of these certifications, you find people just getting forty and a half. When you really go no, that was thirty nine and a half, and it's been bumped up to get to get a label. You've really got to get to kind of engage with certification. You cannot take it on face value. You really have to, you really have to look at these things. I mean, I think one of the things that we see, um, if we take a, a you know a, a role of business and business models, we actually one of the things that we we encourage people to do is to do a dependency audit. What do you depend on um, to allow your business model to to kind of like persist? And that's actually been really, I think, a really powerful way to switch around and sort of go no, but you you. Most, most businesses fail. 
you know, most businesses are actually fragile, precarious kind of institutions that need state protection to allow them to exist. When you actually look at what they're dependent on and how much they rely on that to try and get them to change their relationship to, you know, to start to kind of like to, to nourish and build those, those things upon which they depend. And also when we look at something like the sustainable development goals and I accept that they're, you know, they're, they're political issues and, and, and they're politically determined as much as anything. But what they do is they actually, when you use the sustainable development goals as an audit, you actually think that sustainability is actually quite a, a normal type of activity. I mean, who's against hunger? Who wants to kind of like, who wants to kind of like high, uh, kind of promote poverty? Who wants to create unsafe communities and things like that? Now, these are actually kind of like, you know, quite, quite old values. And you actually discover when you look at, look at the, there, you can see you're actually businesses are making, making sort of progress, you know, and not, they're not there. But when you look at things like um, sort of like gender, where they're actually at least they're accepting there's a problem now, and they're trying to do something to something to to, to resolve it, um, and also, you know, the kind of the role of the state and and putting the foundations, you know, so things like you when you one of the things that we've tried to do is look at where change has happened, and where has change happened quickly, and you've got stuff. So things like um, smoking. And look at the the assemblage of different forces that came around addressing kind of tobacco from these different things and actually transformed what was uh, a kind of like a, a very much part of every, you know kind of everyone's culture and actually made a radical change and it's worth reflecting upon the message there and if we think about sustainability where well, we're doing the same do the same for tobacco for biodiversity let's try to do the same for the oceans as we did for tobacco and seat belts and things which were seen as, you know, you're never going to get that to happen. I, I, I still can't believe the overnight success of banning tobacco smoking in pubs and restaurants. And, and don't, don't tell anyone with, with hardly any policing. Like in, where I'm, I'm sitting in Scotland, the Highlands of Scotland, there was two people in there who were responsible for it over a massive kind of like a, a massive kind of area but it changed because it, it was kind of seen there. So I think it's there. And, and then as I think about trying to promote, we need to, we need to promote different business models. We need to let people know. How many people know what a social enterprise is? How many people know the difference between a cooperative or a, or a kind of like a, a employee kind of employee kind of like trust? We need, to, we need to change the narrative about business and say it's not multinational corporations. It's something else. It can be different. The comic book kind of version of business that seems to be kind of infesting the media is one of one of the biggest problems. And I think that we have responsibilities in some dimensions as social scientists to challenge that and actually to kind of to bring. We need to be able to make aware there's a, there's different models. What's the benefits of these different models, and what are the kind of the strengths of, of these different things? as well as we do need to rely on the state because it's there. But we also need to turn around and a lot of activism has been really powerful because what it does is it identifies choices that businesses have and they do a moral dramatization of the choice. The Brent Spar event with, with kind of Shell and wanting to dispose of it. They said, that's all we can do. Greenpeace turned it into a choice and actually demonstrated that they were taking an immoral, irresponsible decision they didn't have to take. And I think that that's a very kind of powerful way to actually to, to, to get that, to, to point out, yeah, there are tax havens. You, have the, you, don't have to, you, you don't have to put your money in a tax haven. You're choosing to do it, and you should be accountable for that choice. But... Thank you, Ian. Um, moving now over to Carl, um, I don't know if you want to speak to that same point about uh, the kind of the proliferation of different forms of doing the right thing. Um, Will Harvey raises the interesting point of whether we need something that's a bit more systematic and coordinated um, to do all the things those things do, or is it better to have uh, a thousand flowers blooming? Um, so uh, what are your thoughts on that, Carl? Sorry, you're muted. Uh, Carl, you need to unmute. Anyone would have thought I've never used Zoom before, Harry. Um, 
you know, just further to, to Ian's point, I think it's also worth remembering that we're in a position now where it is the idea that the corporation is often considered as the kind of de facto way of organizing. And also remembering that this hasn't always been the case. We used to have public organizations. They were all privatized. Um, well, the majority of them were privatized, but public organizations were once away. You know, mutual funds were all demutualized. You know, you don't see co-ops and, and the other kinds of things. So <clears throat> there's, I mean, when we talk about uh, legal solutions, it's not just about regulations of corporations, but it's also about what, what new kind of legal vehicles can be created to enable different types of corporations. Now, the B Corp is kind of an example of that, but a fairly, not, you know, not one that's especially radical in, in, in many ways. So I think that, that shift needs to come. And that's, in a sense, a broader historical, uh, historical shift and a cultural shift that, that needs to be made as well, just as it's been a historical and cultural shift that got us to, the, to this place. But also um, a cultural one. I mean, the idea of of of, um, of the primacy of the shareholder that wasn't always the case in corporations. I mean, again, that was something that historical that coming into the eighties and nineties, the kind of move towards uh, you know in the kind of post Reagan Thatcher world and this valorization of business and enterprise and and all these things that were going to save us and you know, the sham of trickle-down economics, all of these things uh, were connected to shareholder value. It wasn't always that way. Now, you get people now talking about stakeholder capitalism, uh, you know, to, to paraphrase uh, Orwell, some stakeholders are more important than others, it would seem, uh, in, this, in, in this scheme. So I think there needs to be, in a sense, a new political imagination needs to emerge that can lead this change, just as it was a new political imagination back in the 80s that led to the change that got us into the trouble we're in now. So I think there's a the next generation of politicians and, and young people I see, you know, um, uh, um, uh, now um, kind of emerging and even kind of going through university, I think they have that imagination. So I really think I don't want to, you know, put the next generation responsible for all the problems that my generation caused. But to some extent, that is the case. And I think there's a huge opportunity there um, uh, for that to happen. So I think there is some room uh, uh, for optimism. Thank you, Carl. Um, I hand over to Catherine now. Um, quite a lot of chunky subjects have, have passed under the bridge uh, since the last round of questions. But if there's anything specific you want to come back to there. Yeah, I'll just make two very quick points. I've got an eye on the on the clock. One is, um, Ian, I completely agree with your point around you know, the reality of a huge diversity of, of business models out there. I think one of the things that I find most disappointing is that so often it is that comic book caricature that so much of our politicians respond to. And just to give you an example, we're, we're both in Scotland. Last week, there was a 10-year economic strategy released, and it is essentially 1980s trickle-down economics enterprise, innovation, productivity are unilaterally good things with no values, no direction, no understanding of the, you know, the quality and the sort of enterprise, the sort of productivity, product, let alone productivity of what. And, and so, I mean, that, that valorization of that narrow business model, I think is profoundly sad and taking, taking us very back, I think particularly those of us who allowed ourselves to hope things were a little bit nicer up, up here in Scotland. And I want to just share in, I guess, in a way, one of the questions that keeps me awake at night uh, is the role of explicitly PLCs as inequality generating machines. Because if we take Thomas Piketty's you know, famous <laughs> equation that inequality, economic inequality, vertical inequality increases then when the returns on capital, the rent, is greater than growth. So R is greater than G. Essentially, when your wealth makes more money for you than any of us could earn through earning a living through wages and salaries, then all the tropes around impact investing and doing good by doing well are essentially adding to inequality because they're adding to the resources of those who have already got enough to invest. And until we have a good hard look at that reality, 
we're still going to have a big, big, powerful, if not numerically dominant, sort of business models in our economic ecosystem that are pushing towards greater economic inequality with all the problems we have that. So anyone who has a solution to that, please get in touch because I'd love to hear. It's the sort of thing that keeps me, keeps me awake at 3 a.m. I think it is actually 3 a.m. In, in, in Australia where Carl was calling in from. So um, to him, that's not too far-fetched. He is receiving, uh, receiving questions at, at this hour. Um, finally, we have a few minutes left, uh, so I'm going to turn to Andrea. So if, if there's anything there you want to come back on about all the different uh, proliferation of different forms of, uh, of, of doing, uh, of, of building back better, of doing business better, of, of stopping business as usual. And, and, and I guess the, the question of coordinating and, you know, constructing something more systematic out of that. Actually, I, I like the discussion a lot. I think it's very important. And I, but I don't see, let's say, uh, an alternative between, let's say, all these kinds of, of cooperatives on the one side and state coordination uh, on the other. You need both. Um, I think it's, it's, it's short and long term. The state can act very quickly. Changing the whole uh, economy by, by cooperatives takes a long time. Uh, but I think it's extremely worthwhile, and I'm, I'm very happy for every cooperative that is being set up. I think in Germany, we have a long history uh, of, of, of successful cooperatives in the financial sector. We have cooperative banks uh, that work very well, that have not been hurt in the financial crisis as our private banks. So I think this is an excellent way um, uh, to go. And I think also, I also like this uh, the issue about the company statute that Catherine just brought up. I mean, uh, in Germany, we have a large problem that companies are trying to avoid co-determination, which I think is also extremely useful where workers have a say uh, in many important issues of companies by switching to, let's say, UK um, uh, types of, of company uh, statutes. Uh, well, Brexit in this way <laughs> has a good thing, but we still have this uh, the statute uh, with us. Uh, so I think these issues are really important, uh, and I would I think they are way more important. Uh, at least from my perspective, then they're looking at, at, at corporate social responsibility initiatives. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, perfect time in there for me to wrap up and thank very much um, our contributors today, Carl, Catherine, Andreas and Ian, um, for your provocative and interesting reflections that's given us a chance to cover so many different aspects of the world uh, that is uh, confronting us today, including the situation uh, in Ukraine. Um, so it's been Bristol University Press webinar. Um, as I think mentioned in the chat several times, there's 50% there's, there's off all of the books that uh, our contributors have written um, here today, 50% discount um, using the code BUSINESS50. Um, and that will be sent to you after the event, actually. So I'm not sure why I'm telling you, to be honest. I'm just reading the notes um, like a robot. Um, but you also get details of the next Bristol University Press webinar, um, which will be on the future of universities, which is a, a pain, well, <laughs> an interesting question, let's say, for, uh, for those of us in the UK and elsewhere to be discussing. So thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you to our wonderful contributors um, and have a lovely evening or in Carl's case, uh, a lovely rest of your morning um, down under. So thanks for joining uh, and goodbye.